welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series, which is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the US Department of, Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argo, and Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marquez, and uh, uh, with my colleague Ashley Barker, we will be the hosts for today's from Oak Ridge. Uh, uh, we'll be uh, the hosts for today's webinars. Uh, I'm with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Today's webinar is uh, on automated Fortran C++ bindings for large scale scientific applications. And it will be presented by Seth Johnson from uh, Oak Ridge. Seth works on high performance computing radiation transport as a research staff member at Oak Ridge uh, National Lab. He has a background in nuclear engineering with a master's uh, from Texas AM and a PhD from the University of Michigan. But he says that he currently finds himself researching software advancements more than performing traditional engineering uh, analysis. Over his career, uh, he has developed new methods and tools in hybrid deterministic Monte Carlo transport, computational geometry, sensitivity, and uncertainty methods, automated interlanguage, code binding, and high energy physics. We have issued more than 107 tickets for this webinar. Let's see how many folks will show up. Uh, all attendees have been muted. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I have pasted those addresses already in the chat. Uh, we'll, we have asked Seth to have breaks so people can ask questions. Uh, with that, Seth, please, I'll stop my sharing and we'll take the stand. All right. Thank uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so as Osni said, I'm Seth Johnson. I work at Oak Ridge in the uh, High Performance Computing Methods for Nuclear Applications Group. Um, and I will be discussing some of the work that I've done with uh, binding Fortran and C++, especially for large scale scientific applications. Uh, so overview, I'll give an introduction first, um, introduce some of the different tools and methods for uh, binding C++ and Fortran then spending a fair bit of time specifically going over the tool that I've helped develop, Swig Fortran, um, go over some strategies, and then uh, introduce some example libraries that take advantage of this technology to uh, make uh, C++ libraries available to Fortran. Um, so I'll pause at a couple of these places for questions. All right, so introduction. So you saw that um, I'm, in nuclear engineering, um, and how did I get to Fortran C++? Well, there's a couple of different ways independently that have brought me here. Um, SCALE is a nuclear engineering code at Oak Ridge National Laboratory that originally started in the very late 60s um, and has grown extensively. And as time has gone on, we've incorporated more and more C++ components. And in fact, most of the code these days is being written in C++. Um, <clears throat> so there's a uh, drive to adapt the older pieces of code effectively to the new pieces of code, and especially in a way where we can use uh, these older pieces of code at exascale um, to do cross-section calculations and so forth massively in parallel, um, which means getting rid of a lot of the uh, IO-based binding that used to take place and move toward in-memory coupling between the two codes. Um, Vera also uh, relates to how I got involved in this. So Vera is a multi-physics code that uh, incorporates both C++ and Fortran applications together, again, using in-memory bindings and again, targeting large-scale applications um, up to exascale. And then Impact is another code that's part of Vera um, that originally motivated some of the work to provide uh, C++ Fortran coupling for the Trilino numeric solver library. Um, so they originally had hand wrapped calls for uh, for Trilinos inside of C++ and um, that helped motivate a, a new iteration of uh, Fortran bindings to the to the Trilinos library. So uh, ECP has been going on since 2015. So it's a five year point right now. Um, and at the original point of its inception, um, many of the scientific application codes were primarily in Fortran. Um, and a lot of the capabilities that, uh, that are uh, performing at Exascale are written in C++ libraries and actually sort of C++ targeted technologies such as CUDA. 
So um, there is a, a driver for providing some of these high performance, massively parallel heterogeneous libraries to Fortran and uh, Trilinos was the specific example for that one. Um, so it's numerical solvers. We wanted to uh, generate uh, modern bindings to Fortran libraries for that. So that's where Fortrelino started and that's uh, how this project got its initial uh, funding through Fortrelinos. So as times goes on, actually there's an interesting trend in the uh, prevalence of Fortran in Exascale. So at, at the inception about 20 different codes were using a combination of Fortran and uh, C++ and a little bit of Python. Um, and as time's gone on, more of these codes have converted to start adding C++ into them. And then some of them have even gone so far as to remove Fortran entirely. And one of the reasons is that um, at Exascale, most of the computing power comes from these heterogeneous architectures, which aren't primarily driven by scientific application. So the primary funding for the development of new GPUs is not scientific applications. We're an important part of it, but um, but other industries, uh, computer gaming and business and everything else are the primary drivers for GPU development, which means that Fortran as a domain specific language for science can somehow can get a little bit left in the lurch um, as far as, as the technology development goes. So um, even though it's possible to run uh, CUDA applications in Fortran, the capabilities in Fortran tend to lag behind C++ because uh, there's there's a need to play catch up with the compiler writers and the deployment and so forth. So as time goes on, a lot of these projects have found that it's more effective to write the heterogeneous components in C++ CUDA and then bind to Fortran and then over time uh, even remove some of the Fortran components. So there's this, this chart here organizes the um, the programming languages by, by sort of higher level on the top and lower level on the bottom. And so uh, again, there's, there's this drive toward higher level computing because of the, the uh, necessity of, of interfacing with the heterogeneous architectures. So that drives more of an interest in coupling Fortran and C++ because we wanna be able to give projects that use Fortran the option of integrating new pieces of C++ that those projects might write themselves or using uh, existing C++ libraries. And so for the C++ library developers themselves, um, it's good to help uh, motivate Fortran users to use your code. Um, there's possibilities for further development and follow on funding, getting some of the uh, high end Fortran scientific apps involved for if you're a Fortran app developer, um, there's a lot of capabilities in C++ that can be applied to your uh, code. So you can reuse algorithms and tools that other people have written um, and target and not have to write them yourself. You know, the, the whole point of a library is not having to rewrite code. Uh, for multi-physics projects, as time goes on, higher fidelity drives the need to couple more and more codes together. And some of those codes are in Fortran and some are in C++. So there's an increasing need for integration across languages due to multi-physics. Um, and finally, for teams that want to move between Fortran and C++ or migrate in little pieces at a time, um, having an effective way and low overhead way of coupling the two languages um, helps motivate a automated uh, Fortran C++ binding layer. Okay, so uh, I'll quickly go over some tools and ways that this has been done uh, currently and, and, and in the past as well. So I've kind of assembled a couple criteria for uh, ad hoc criteria for a report card and what um, and how wrapping is done. So portability, um, are you able to use the same generated wrappers across compilers and across platforms, which is uh, very important um, with new machines coming online if you want to operate on the leadership class computers, especially if you're interested in using the vendor provided um, compilers because assumptions that you can make about G Fortran and GCC don't necessarily hold on uh, X, for, X Fortran or the IBM Fortrans or the Cray Fortrans or any of those. Um, so portability can be important when moving to exascale class machines. 
reusability is important. Um, you don't want to have to copy paste a lot of code by yourself whenever you're generating new interfaces. Um, capability is important for the application side um, because ideally you want to be able to have all the capability that the C++ library has exposed to Fortran. This isn't always possible, but um, the more that you have, the better. Um, maintainability is critical for large applications because you don't want to spend all of your time um, modifying by hand the bindings that you've written to keep them up to date with your C++ library. Robustness is also important um, by making sure by construction that your interfaces are consistent and that you don't introduce um, aliasing errors or type errors or something. Um, keeping this automated ends up giving your code a, a much better stability. And then finally, um, the integration aspect is how long, how, how much work is needed to get the interlanguage binding code working both from a development perspective where you have to regenerate the bindings and then from a deployment perspective when you're shipping out the Fortran bindings to users. So the traditional way, I've got my little emoji uh, report card here and then sort of representative way of, uh, of how much effort is, is needed for this with a bunch of people and, and babies representing the future developers that have to grow up into your code and become big grown up developers. Um, so the traditional is, is hand binding code. So this is usually, uh, you've taken a C++ library and written a C interface layer that calls and wraps your C++ functions, usually has a void star pointer representing some objects and some enums to represent different functionalities and so forth. Um, some of these uh, interfaces have Fortran interface binding declarations that are written in Fortran 2003, um, but a lot of them actually use Fortran 77 and 90 native integer types um, and then rely on configure time introspection on the compiler to try to get the integer types the right size and make sure that they're com compatible. Um, and this can be pretty stable. It's also very difficult to do for some things like strings where the, uh, the ABI for um, strings is not very portable um, for the older style Fortran, especially. And so examples of this would be like SuperLU, Strumpack, and Tasmanian. So because they don't necessarily rely on um, ISO standardized um, portability, like the, um, the Fortran 2003 that provides, uh, it can be uh, somewhat unportable. Um, you can get errors that creep in based on invalid compiler settings or something. Um, usually not very reusable because you have to copy paste the interface code um, from one function to another. It's usually a small subset of the capability of your full code um, because again, you have to invest effort into each and every function that you want to wrap. Maintainability is a big problem because you, again, because they're all manually generated, you have to go back and change every function whenever, if your library interface changes. Robustness is an issue because you've got to manually ensure that your C declaration types are the same as your Fortran types um, and that your uh, configure based introspection is working correctly. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, user deployment because it's just a, a single file that you can distribute to your users, but it can be a, a, a headache from a, from a development perspective. So the next sort of step up in complexity is using a, a script that's written specifically for a given project. And usually this works pretty well because projects have standard uniform header definitions. Um, they use the same styles. And so it's pretty easy to parse something with a Perl script and spit out a bunch of glue code. Um, so examples of this would be like MPitch, HDF5, and Silo, so several of the uh, scientific um, computing libraries. And usually it's, um, again, you've got hard-coded types and uh, a Perl script that, that processes all this. So can be portable because some of these do use Fortran 2003. Um, they're somewhat reusable in that uh, because it does parse the header files, adding new functions can automatically generate new uh, Fortran interfaces. Capability still usually relies on the, these being flat functions with opaque types. Uh, not great maintainability 
they do are uh, they, they are pretty robust because they've got this automatic translation. Um, and then from an integration perspective, you've got to know which scripts to run to update the interfaces. Um, and then you're just deploying Fortran 90 and C++ file. So your users don't have a problem with it. Okay, one step further along the line is having a more full featured automatic code generator. So this is one where you um, where you can wrap C++ uh, objects, even C++ classes um, with more complicated glue code. So instead of just having a simple um, Fortran function declaration, you can have another layer of uh, proxy code that's written in Fortran that sits on top of that to provide a more full featured uh, Fortran like class interface. Um, so two examples of this, one is, is an in-house tool um, used in scale for some time um, that, that even does stuff like template substitution. Um, it, it just generates a bunch of wrapper code for the object translation um, and the proxy code in Fortran. Uh, Shroud is another Lawrence Livermore one that does very similar things. But for both of these, you have to manually declare your C++ interface in a secondary file. So it's an XML file for this one and a YAML file for here. So because both of these use ISO 2003 um, standard for Fortran, they're quite portable because they're using types that are guaranteed to be uh, translatable across, um, across languages. They are quite reusable because they're using um, templates effectively to convert the types between the two languages. Um, they're also much more full featured than, than simple function wrapping because um, they tend to generate um, class interfaces as well. Maintainability can be an issue um, because you have to update these interface declaration files anytime you change your C++ library interfaces. Um, they are robust because they're using scripting and then integration. Um, usually you have to manually rerun these, um, but again, your users are happy because it just shows up as a Fortran 90 and C++ file. Okay, um, so the last um, development or level of complexity is uh, a code that can actually parse your C++ files and use those to generate the Fortran wrapping code. And Swig Fortran was developed specifically with that intent. So um, Swig, I'll go over in a little bit and give some background, um, but it is a, a template or a wrapper generator code for multiple languages um, that has a built-in C++ parser that reads um, your C++ library's header files, sees the declarations, and then translates those, in this case, to Fortran um, C++ binding glue, and then generates uh, Fortran proxy interfaces on top of that. So because it uses Fortran 2003, it's quite portable. It uses um, a standard library of wrapping glue code, and so it's quite reusable. Capabilities, extremely fill featured. Um, maintainability can be an issue. It's usually, um, it's, this is one of those languages and tools that 90% of it's really easy and 10% of it's really, really hard. Um, so for the simple stuff, it's extremely simple. Um, but when you run into problems, you tend to need an expert on hand to help you out with it. Unfortunately, um, there is something of a growing community of people who've been using Swig Fortran. Um, so, so this is, you know, we still have need the, the baby that grows up into a, an engineer, um, but mo the robot here does most of the work. <laughs> um, and integration, uh, I have a happy face here because um, C++, uh, CMake actually now includes uh, the ability to generate um, to use Swig Fortran to generate and integrate Fortran 90 and C++ wrappers directly into a CMake project. So there's not too much in the way of overhead for integrating this, both from a developer perspective and from a deployment perspective. OK, um, I'm going to pause here for questions. Yes, really quickly. Yeah, Seth, actually, there is one here that goes back to slide number six. OK. Uh, and the question is, is Fortran losing ground as a in quotes, fast, efficient HPC language, or do you think it's more because people started pushing for writing new scientific and HPC codes in C++? Or is, or is it mostly gene, uh, generic programming? 
which is missing in modern Fortran? I, I think there's a lot of um, <laughs> yes to all of them, I think. Um, so one of the, the biggest thing is that these days, um, it tends to be the size of the community that drives the capability of, of, a, of a language and it's a system of packages almost as much. If you look at um, Python and Julia and um, all of the other scripting languages, um, with the prevalence of open source, it's almost as much the, the size of the community that drives the uptake and, and advancement of an application. Um, and Fortran, because it's more uh, exclusive to um, traditional scientific applications, doesn't quite have that community. And because it's it's got a, a very long legacy, um, things like libraries and so forth aren't as well developed on it. There's, there's something of a push nowadays. Um, I recently saw coming out of Los Alamos, there's a push for, um, for a Fortran sort of package manager um, that's meant to distribute more Fortran libraries and try to get that sort of community ongoing. Um, but, but that community isn't there. And um, Fortran's also hindered because it's, uh, it depends mostly on those compiler intrinsics that, um, that for, for most of the capability, again, because of the lack of, of, a, of a package manager and a distribution system, um, you have to wait for the standard to advance, then you have to wait for the compiler writers to implement it. And so what ends up happening so even um, Fortran 2003 wasn't really fully implemented in GCC until 2018, maybe, you know, 15 years from the standard publication to the implementation and the, the primary open source implementation. Um, you don't see that with C++ because it's got such a, a larger, more interested and more diverse community. Um, so I think that those are a couple of the key reasons why Fortran's losing ground in addition to the heterogeneous aspect that I mentioned earlier. I, I'm, uh, Seth, I, I see some um, discussion here in the chat, but I think it's better if you, um, if you continue. Uh, continue, you say? Okay. Yes, please. Let's resume then. Yeah, I'm, it's a it's a very um, touchy topic and has a lot of answers to it. So there's a lot of opportunities for discussion and we can continue that later. Um, but for now, um, I'll give an overview and some details about Swig Fortran, which is a, a fork of the Swig uh, application that uh, that can you generate Fortran. So Swig is a project from that started in about 1995 um, that generates interfaces to C and C++ libraries, um, both the, the inter function calls and data types and so forth. So that target languages, um, usually scripting languages, traditionally in Swig, can invoke the functions and use the data um, seamlessly across the, the, uh, the language barrier. So what it does is it generates glue code, uh, a, a set of C linkage wrappers to the C++ functions, um, and then a set of interfaces in the target language that um, adapt those C interfaces to make it appear more idiomatic in the target language. Um, so Swig does not couple the target languages to other target languages, so we can't use it to generate Fortran Python bindings, um, and it does not uh, understand any of the target languages per se. So you can't give Swig a Fortran file and give and get a C++ interface. It's strictly for generating um, target language interfaces to C++ libraries. Um, the way this works in practice is you give Swig a, a .i interface file, which is usually, which can be as small as a couple lines and can be um, as large as you want to, depending on how complex the, the language bindings you need are. Um, and these interface files point to existing scientific library headers using this percent include instead of pound include. Um, yeah, so the more complicated your conversions, your type conversions and your function declarations are and templates and so forth, uh, the more extra interface code is required to generate these, these interface files. Um, so or to generate the source code files. So Swig will take that .i file, run a standalone application and generate um, CXX and F90 files um, 
that reference the functions in your in your header file. So the wrapper code can be generated, uh, can be distributed alongside of your library like regular source code files. They don't have to be generated on the fly necessarily. Um, and importantly, your library users don't even have to know that they're there. So the library users typically don't have to even install Swig and let alone um, know that that's what's generating your source code files. Um, the other thing is your your source the the generated code is not licensed by Swig, so there's no extra restrictions on the licensing, um, even though Swig is what spit it out. So it can have it can inherit the the license of whatever library uh, you have. Okay, so um, for Fortran specifically, what uh, Swig Fortran does is it uses Fortran 2003 standard um, data types which are defined by the Fortran ISO committee um, as having exact guaranteed compatibility with C data types, um, translates uh, your C++ code into sets or structs of those data types, passes them through a uh, bind C interface, um, and then into a wrapper function that Swig generates, which converts the C type to the C++ type which then calls a C++ library function. And then it'll, if you need to have a return type, it will spit the data back out the other way. So for example, a array would be a um, C pointer plus a size um, and a class would be a, a C pointer plus like a, um, an ownership flag. Um, and so because Fortran 2003 defines um, bind C compatible structs as well as data types, you can end up uh, using pretty complex uh, data structures that get passed through the different layers and guarantee the compatibility because they're using um, the ISO standard types. Um, Swig Fortran itself supports a, a number of features, including you know, the basic primitive types that you'd expect, but other things like enumerations, uh, class interfaces with inheritance, um, some of the standard library types, as well as C strings converting those natively into Fortran strings, um, function pointers and generating function pointer interfaces from C++ function pointer definitions, um, arrays and the ability to pass um, data back and forth without having to copy the contents of the array, function overloading, template instantiation, compile time constants, and a number of other things, exception handling, thrust, and so forth. So it's, it's quite full featured um, and can generate very rich Fortran idiomatic um, types in, in, um, in the Fortran library code that you generate. So a quick example of what this looks like is here is a C++ library function, um, takes a two ints and then returns an int and it's a function called add. Um, here's the swig file that we've defined. So usually you just have to add the percent module and then a, um, a percent include point into the library here. Um, for the purposes of this library, I've added a couple of, of explicit type conversion code that basically says, um, instead of forcing the library user to use a C int, I want you to treat this as a uh, Fortran native int on the Fortran side interface. So, um, so it maps the Fortran type to a native Fortran integer, converts the input that the library user will give to a C integer type. Um, and then whenever you return an integer, it will convert the C integer into a Fortran native one. Um, and so even though these are usually null ops, if C int and your Fortran integer are the same, um, they won't necessarily be. So this is the kind of extra code that's emitted in simpler generators that are necessary to guarantee standards compatibility across a range of compilers. Um, so, Here's, here's some of the code that gets generated on the right. So there's the C interface here where it takes uh, two C integers as uh, pointers as arguments and returns an integer type, um, converts the type, calls the C function, and then returns the result. Um, the Fortran C interface, it declares a bind C function to that wrapper that it added, as well as the C int uh, integer types. And then it also generates a proxy function where um, this is what the Fortran library user will actually see. So it's a function add that takes uh, two native Fortran integer types, returns a native Fortran integer types, uh, 
has intermediate C integer values that's used to pass to the C++ layer. And then it does the, the argument conversion as well as the um, wrapper function call in the middle there. So all of this is, is automatically generated and is basically opaque um, even to the developers and certainly to the, to the users. So what this looks like in practice is a Fortran um, library application user um, we'll say, use this module that Swig generated, use the add function, and then take my two native integer types and add them together and write it up. Um, so it ends up being a, a pretty seamless from the user side, even though there's a lot of uh, glue code that's been generated in the middle by Swig. Um, I'll shuffle through some, some quick features here. Um, some of the extra stuff that makes this more interesting, especially from a scientific library code. So I know some uh, libraries like HDF5, for example, um, and other numeric solvers declare C interfaces. And there's a very low overhead way of using Swig Fortran to generate um, just the C bindings so that you can use um, Fortran uh, interface um, structs types that it generates as well as um, direct interfaces to the C functions, um, guaranteeing the uh, compatibility between the Fortran and C layers because it generates the, the ISO C types. Um, so it tells it to not create the proxy class so we can just use the raw pointers um, and directly call the C functions from Fortran. So that's one of the, the slimmer interfaces that Swig can do. Um, Swig supports templating. So if you have a templated class, um, because there's no way to dynamically generate new C++ code by introspecting the Fortran, um, you have to explicitly instantiate inside of your interface code, uh, whether you want the classes and functions to be uh, templated on a type. But you can also instantiate overloaded functions. So even though um, We've got two instances of the same function by overloading it with the same library name. Um, we tell Swig Fortran to use a generic interface there. So, so one call to print thing will then dispatch based on the argument types to the Fortran code. Um, and the, the class type ends up getting instantiated as two separate opaque class wrappers. So thing int and thing double um, will be instantiated based on that library code without without you having to, to copy paste or anything like that. So the templating here is, is one way of uh, providing some level of, of generic programming to Fortran, even though it's it's generic only in the sense that the, the library uh, user can can reuse the same code and not not the um, or the library developer is the one that that determines the instantiations as opposed to a more truly generic, which would be the, the application code. Uh, instantiates it. All right, so we've got exception handling, or you can actually um, catch C++ exceptions and function calls and then handle them in Fortran by checking uh, an integer that's that's stored inside of the um, generated um, Fortran wrapper module. So that's a way of like actually um, handling uh, C++ errors as well as just besides just ignoring them or causing the application code to crash. So that can be pretty powerful for applications that rely heavily on, on exception-based um, interactions when things go wrong. Um, array views are one of the ways of uh, effectively passing data between the C++ Fortran layer without uh, the overhead of copying the actual data. So for example, I'll show a, a library that um, defines a, a sort function that takes a pointer to an array data and the number of elements in the array, calls standard sort on it. Um, and this will actually sort the Fortran array data in line in the user code. So even though that there's quite a lot of wrapper code that gets generated, uh, it turns out that this is not too much of an efficiency overhead, especially if your function calls can take um, a lot of data per function call. So um, in the case of constructing a sparse matrix, um, uh, my colleague Andre um, did an example of building a matrix out by uh, individual function calls, one per element that you construct, or one per row, or one call that has all the data 
um, in three separate arrays. So the matrix has the highest effectively uh, um, operations per data and element has the lowest. Um, so there's a substantial difference in performance um, from a relative perspective, even though obviously for this um, case, there's you know a few tenths of a second, it's not a big deal. Um, interestingly, link time optimization can also help mitigate the performance cost of these extra wrapper layers um, because a lot of the, the code can end up being sort of inline by the compiler if it's smart enough. Okay, I'm going to pause again for questions because that was a lot. Yeah, we have some here. Let me go from, I think, the bottom here. Uh, do you have an example or can you comment on string handling? Uh, I don't have one in the presentation, but um, basically um, the string handling is done by copying from a Fortran um, len star uh, input to a uh, character array of ISO C chars um, and then passing that with the Fortran provided size of the, of the string um, into the, the C++ code. And then for uh, return values for strings, it can actually do return a allocatable uh, length string as well. So it ends up being a pretty rich interface without having to have fixed size strings. It's actually able to use the dynamic, um, dynamic strings using the native Fortran uh, intrinsic function calls. Yes, I suggest you, you know, later you can add an example in the Q&A. Uh, so that's yeah. another, another question here. Is it possible to say a few words comparing or contrasting Swig and Rose, you know, the Rose compiler developed at Lawrence Livermore? Uh, I, I remember looking at Rose at, at some point, I can't recall enough about it to make a meaningful comparison. Um, I, I remember, I think Rose was one of the, there's, there's at least a couple of different um, libraries that are out there and a little bit more established, or at least they've been around for a longer time that have, that require the declaration of data types and function calls um, in a um, in a domain specific language sort of declaration, and then it will generate C plus plus functions and data types as well as Fortran or Python or whatever. Um, so it, it it's sort of a different application in that you have to define your library based on this external uh, application rather than using an external application to provide wrappers to your library. I don't know if that's what Rose does, but that's what um, another one that name, whose name escapes me does. Another one here, is there anything users can do or have, oops, I just, uh, is there anything users can do or have to do for more efficient link time optimization? Uh, so, I mean, for, for LTO, it's usually just a matter of passing the right flags and using the right linker. Um, I know C plus or C make rather newer versions have um, better intrinsic support for LTO. I haven't honestly played around with it too much. Um, and, and again, the easier, almost easier than LTO is just making sure that, that you're passing around arrays instead of elements. Seth, let's take another question here, the last one in this, this break. How does Fortran C, C++ interoperability, oops, just uh, work for shared memory parallel programs? For example, for calling a C code from an OpenMP Fortran loop. Yeah, um, so the library, so the library that you've got open, um, so inside of a, a Fortran application, you can either establish um, the MPI, initialize MPI through Fortran or C++. Um, and Swig, um, actually there, Swig does provide a, uh, a conversion so that you can go from a C MPI communicator to a Fortran MPI communicator. Um, but effectively the, the C and the Fortran code are operating on in the same process um, and they can reuse communicators between the two languages um, 
but you know, just like with any other MPI code, uh, you've got to connect them properly across the different processes and get the, the MPI communication working right. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have other questions here, but it's just the participants, we are, we are going to put these questions in the Q&A and uh, for the questions that don't, don't get answered today. So we'll be sending you the Q&A later. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you. Uh, please continue, Seth. Definitely. Okay. Um, so the last section uh, is I'm going to sort of go over some strategies for um, Fortran application and C++ library binding. So I, I kind of touched on this earlier, which is um, how do you add new capabilities that, that you think should be library functions? So this is something that I'm not the only one who has this problem. Somebody else has to have it. That's what you put in a library. So um, the, the first way is the longest standing way, which is you sort of wait for the standards committee to uh, define a compiler intrinsic that does what you want, um, and then wait for the compiler implementers to put it in. So this is, you know, I, I've seen for upcoming versions of Fortran, uh, there's a demand for generic programming. So you wait for the standards committee to define what that generic programming looks like, and then you have to wait five or 10 years maybe for the compiler writers to actually figure out how to make that definition work in practice for the Fortran code. Um, for other, you know, numerical intrinsics is obviously easier to do, uh, but it still relies on, on this long process. So the second way is, is the um, typical path that Fortran codes go, which is you um, look at your numerical recipes book or, or some sort of you know, textual uh, <laughs> representation of the algorithm and you put it in there. So, you know, I think um, our scale code um, that, that our group works on has something like three or four different implementations of sort in there um, for different use cases. And it's the same algorithm, but just implemented with different data types and different modules and so forth. Um, as I mentioned, there's a, a budding interest in a package ecosystem. So a way that different Fortran developers can write library functions and, and reuse them across applications, which is an extremely laudable goal. Um, and uh, so the, the final two are the ones that have the most relevance to this presentation, which is if you're interested in the library capabilities of a C++ code, you can help contribute Fortran interfaces to those by using Swig Fortran. Um, and similarly, if you're a application code that wants to more heavily um, invest in C++ and perhaps gradually transition uh, over to using more C++ over time, um, you can write uh, new C++ code inside of your application and then use Swig Fortran to um, give you the glue codes that your existing Fortran uh, library, your existing Fortran app code can call those new C++ functions. And that's a pathway to over time converting um, a, a, a Fortran code into a C++ one. And that's one that, that some of the ECP codes have taken, although I don't think uh, any of them necessarily have been using Swig Fortran in that internal conversion process. So if you're a C++ library developer um, and you want to add Fortran interfaces, how do you go about doing that? Well, um, you can take a sort of bottom up or top down approach, depending on um, your library and the needs of the application that you're sort of targeting. Um, so you can take each one of the objects in your library and generate a Fortran wrapper function for it. And so what that ends up doing is it ends up um, making a Fortran application code look a lot like a C++ application code and how the different objects are constructed and how they interact with each other. So it can be kind of complicated. Um, so the other alternative is from a top-down perspective uh, where you write a small C++ wrapper that uh, inter, you know, takes, manages four or five or however many different C++ classes and provides a simplified interface for the particular use case that you think that most applications will want to have. Um, and also important if you're doing library development is to try to make your uh, usage as idiomatic as possible for the Fortran application so that it provides less of a barrier 
for Fortran developers to to use your application or use your library um, rather than making it awkward for them um, because it looks totally foreign to them. So by idiom idiomatic, um, I can I, I provide a couple of uh, examples here. So instead of um, providing iterators like C++ would expect, um, you would give it an array. Um, and instead of having a bunch of individual scalar calls, you would again like try to provide an array because that's how Fortran um, most elegantly passes data around is, is in large arrays. So another example is a particular one that SWIG can help with, um, which is instead of a status value being a, a return value from a function. So in Fortran, um, functions are required to, um, you have to capture the value when you call it, um, unlike the subroutines where you can have optional arguments. And so status values effectively act like optional arguments in Fortran. Um, and so SWIG can, can convert a C++ or a C function that returns a value into a, a Fortran subroutine with an optional argument. Um, classic Fortran is uh, one is the first element of the array, not zero. So uh, whenever you provide indices, so for matrices or, or other uh, like sorting or searching, um, the first element of the result should the, the element should be one index as opposed to zero, and you can use zero to indicate you know not found or something like that. Um, and then finally, uh, instead of requiring your users to say c int and c double, or to hope that um, d zero means c double, or that Fortran integer is the same as c integer, um, you can add the code that does that translation automatically. So it'll be, um, you know, so that the, your library will be hopefully just as performant if the compiler can optimize out a identity translation from one type to another, um, but it will at least compile correctly as opposed to failing if you're using, if, you're, if your compiler happens to use a, a different integer size by default. Okay, so some challenges um, for getting Fortran and C++ to work together. So C and Fortran are both at present, very static languages. Um, when you're generating library functions, they all have to be effectively um, independent. They have to be known at compile time. Um, and C++ is getting much more generic and much more dynamic so that a lot of libraries, um, for example, Cocos, um, are really have become mostly header only. So some of them will still have um, compile time backends and so forth, but most of them, a, a number of C++ libraries are increasingly um, relying on the compiler to dynamically generate the necessary code whenever it's integrated into the user application. Um, and this isn't possible if you're using C or Fortran as an intermediary. Um, because there's no way to regenerate C or C++ wrappers based on the Fortran um, application code, unless you do something like add Python scripting in the middle of it, which I think some applications do. Um, but then anyway, that complicates things. Um, and C++ is getting much more richer and using more type deductions, using stuff like auto and initializer lists. Um, things that, that don't work well with a, a very static language like Fortran. Um, and one final uh, issue that, that's along the same lines uh, with the dynamicism is that uh, SWIG generated interfaces, although they can generate new interfaces based on your compile options, so like enabling um, MPI or some other dependency, um, even though you can generate new SWIG uh, interfaces based on those. If you want to distribute a pre-compiled SWIG interface, um, it's difficult to get that working without C preprocessing in Fortran. Um, if you want to use the same pre-generated interface for multiple different configuration options. All right. Um, since that was a really quick section, I'll just keep going since we're getting close to the end. Um, some example libraries that use SWIG Fortran. Um, so 
FLibCPP is a uh, set of Fortran bindings to the C++ standard library in idiomatic Fortran. So I kind of see this as being um, a, a very good introductory library code for, um, for Fortran applications that want to try using a little bit of, of C++ powered backend. So it gives you the speed and reliability of the C++ standard library, but with idiomatic Fortran. Uh, it's trivial to download and install. It's you know one line of CMake to integrate it into your Fortran code if you're using CMake. Um, it has things like sorting, searching, sets, operations, as well as classes like sets, vectors, and strings, pseudorandom number generators, and other things. So a lot of little components that are, are pretty typical in, um, in scientific application codes that can be difficult to get correct or efficient, um, especially for, um, for complicated use cases. Um, and it also, this kind of serves as a capability demonstration. So uh, for example, you can sort with a callback function so that um, you can define your comparison operator in Fortran and then call the C++ library function using that wrapped callback uh, to sort your array. So it's, it's pretty powerful and um, well-documented. So I encourage any of you uh, who are Fortran users and, and want to replace a hand-rolled sort or search to, to maybe give this a shot. Um, Fortran Linux, as I mentioned at the very beginning, was the original driver for this. So um, it has both the bottom-up and the top-down approaches that I mentioned. So it includes uh, low-level uh, T-Petra and Tefos objects. Uh, as well as uh, high-level solver interfaces. And one of the particularly cool features that this one has is it's got a, an inversion of control um, implementation that allows you to define a Fortran uh, class, a Fortran derived type that extends a SWIG generated wrapper type, which is an alias to the C++ type, and then implement the apply operator in Fortran and get it all to work with the Trilino C++ solvers. So that means that, that you can actually um, implement a uh, non, uh, a matrix free operator in Fortran and then pass this into C++ to be used with the C++ Trilino solvers. So this is a, a pretty cool capability that Andre uh, and I work together on. Um, so one sneak peek is I mentioned um, some of the Thrust OpenACC MPI compatibility. So there is a, a library that I've got um, only like slightly tested, uh, but it basically lets you use SWIG to pass uh, OpenACC based data between Fortran and C++ uh, without having to copy it to the host. So it'll actually do the device pointer translation um, on data before it has to be copied back. So here's an example of, of a tiny OpenACC kernel um, that generates data on the host, copies it to the device, operates on it in a Fortran OpenACC kernel, and then um, calls another C++ CUDA-based kernel on that data without having to copy it back to the device in the meantime. So this capability does work. It's just um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, demand specifically for this yet. So if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to work with fleshing this out, for example. Uh, Swig Fortran is used by a handful of other ECP codes, um, including Sundial's numerical library, Tasmanian, DTK Strumpack, and uh, Scale. So in summary, um, the Exascale is, is a another driver for an increase in the ability to get Fortran and C++ working together and all the other languages too. Um, because there's, there's this heterogeneous computing uh, lag between Fortran and C++, um, it's often a better solution to do a lot of your uh, device programming in C++ and then use whatever Fortran code you have uh, to, to fill in the pieces or, or adapt your existing capabilities. Um, the coupling between C++ and Fortran can be driven by applications that need capabilities or libraries that just want to take a little bit extra time and provide new capabilities for potential applications. <clears throat> 
Swig Fortran is, is one way of producing um, very robust glue code that's uh, idiomatic to Fortran users. And uh, finally, we've got a set of new libraries that, that can give a taste of uh, the capabilities from C++ libraries um, that might pique the interest of, of Fortran app developers out there. So all these are available on GitHub and um, most of them available through SPAC. And then Swig Fortran and Fortrilinos are both distributed with the Exascale software distribution. And I'd be happy to entertain any more questions with the remaining time. All right, Seth, great, thank you. Um, yes, we have some questions here. I'm gonna go to, uh, again, to the participants. I'm gonna consolidate all that came into the chat, into the Q&A, and ask Seth, uh, Seth to go uh, through the Q&A, and then I'll send, we'll send it to everybody who um, signed up for the uh, webinar. So uh, one question here, I see on GitHub that SIGWIG Fortran is a fork of SIGWIG. Any plans to upstream the developments? Uh, yes, I, there's been an open pull request for about three years. Um, the maintainer there has kind of ghosted me. <laughs> so I, 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 I ping him every year or so now. Um, but I hope that it will be integrated. I don't know what would, what, what it would take to actually get that to work. Um, so that's the best I got. So any thoughts? on Fortran 2018, further interoperability with the C? Yeah, no, I, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it looks like, especially um, with with some of the, it would help um, working with some of the more advanced C++ numerical libraries that can handle uh, strided data as well as multi-dimensional data. Um, it would be some extra development as far as SWIG is concerned to, to have a flag that to allows that, that sort of capability. Um, and again, th there's still a matter of waiting for support for, for all the compilers that need it. So, okay, so I invite all the, partic the participants can unmute themselves now. So I invite the participants to ask questions directly to Seth. I also, uh, I have already pasted there in the chat an announcement for the next webinar in this series. It's gonna be on June the 9th, about a month from today, using the PCIP toolkit to achieve your goals. A case study at the HDF group. It's gonna be presented by three people. People, uh, uh, the, we already issued, issuing tickets for that, uh, for that event. So uh, Mark, you have, uh, you raised your hand there. Would like to ask something to, to Seth? think you're muted. Well, he can unmute him, Mark. Oh, okay. Now, it, I'm yeah. sorry, it, it wasn't allowing me to and normally. <laughs> Seth, uh, thanks so much for your work on SWIG and this presentation, very informative. Uh, and one thing I wasn't clear about is, is how much in the way of sort of SWIG uh, interfacing language do I need to be involved in writing in order to, um, you know, and bring in a new a, a typical new library. Is there a lot involved there? Does it does it just parse the new library header files and do it mostly itself? It it varies based on the library. So um, some of the simpler libraries that I've helped adapt literally are just five lines. Um, other more complicated ones that have uh, more complicated C plus plus interfaces like like Trilinos, especially because. Um, there's multiple levels of templating and then lots of helper classes that, that SWIG has to understand. Um, that can be, that one's a little bit more complicated, but, um, but for, for a typical, I'd say C++ 2003 era library, it should only be a, a handful of lines and then templates can make it a little bit more complicated, but not too much more. Other, okay. other questions for, for Seth? Let's see here. I'm going through the Q&A here. It's, so as I said, I'm going to do some uh, consolidation. Go, uh, I'm going to go through the, Q, the chat and put in the uh, Q&A for Seth to uh, uh, take a look. 
uh, let's see, I'm just uh, going through the questions here. Uh, I think we covered almost all. Oh, there is one here. I think it's, it was basically a comment, Seth, but perhaps mm -hmm. you can say something to end. Sure. Uh, so the participants kind of curious about your thoughts on the prospects of Julia for HPC. <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, it seems like, especially the last couple of years, it's had a lot of uptake um, and it seems to be a more agile and modern way of trying to do what I think Fortran is best at, um, making, you know, scientific friendly, rapid development. Um, so I, I think it has a lot of promise. And I think that a lot of uh, codes that traditionally would have been started out as, as Fortran um, test codes could now very effectively um, be Julia codes. So I think it has a lot of promise. Any other questions uh, from the participants? If not, let me share my screen again here just to announce one more time the next webinar in this series. First of all, thank you all for participating. Of course, without your participation, uh, you know, the success of the series would be uh, the one we have right now. <laughs> uh, uh, so we would like to improve the series. So you feel free to give us feedback and even suggest topics for the series that you think topics that we could, you know, uh, add. As a, as webinars. Uh, June the 9th is going to be the next one, the PC toolkit to achieve your goals using the toolkit, a case study of the HDF5, uh, actually HDF group. Uh, it's going to be presented by Elena Permal from the HDF group, Reid Milovics from Sandia, and Elsa Gonziorovsk from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So I think that there is, uh... you have a question, Aditya? I think you can unmute yourself. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Good. I couldn't find the reaction menu for some reason. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, great, uh, great presentation. Thanks. Um, so we have a very template heavy C++ library and I had a couple of questions about that. So from the example that you gave, it looks like we'll have to in the I file, in the dot I file, we kind of write rules to map template instantiations to specific names for each instantiation. Is that right? That's right. So is it can we kind of write a rule to automatically generate those names for the different template instantiations for a given class template, something like that? So Swig has, so it's not, you're going to still have to statically um, almost template or decide which, which kind of uh, data types you want templated on. Um, but Swig supports macros that makes a lot of the template instantiation a lot easier. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the sort, some of the mathematical functions in, um, in the Flib CPP and, and Fortrillinos both use this sort of macro expansion to, to re-template a lot of classes using the same. Um, so there's, there's, you can avoid a lot of the repetition, basically. Okay, okay. Uh, like that's almost like a regex, you know, some, you know, I say class name underscore percentage D is equivalent to template class angle bracket percentage D, uh, you know, like uh, give rules like those, I guess something like that would be possible, I guess. Yep. yep. Okay. Use and, the... Okay, nice. And in your FLIP CPP example, just as an off question, would it, I, I don't think it would be possible to have say an STD vector of a user defined for trend type, right? That's right in general, um, not of a generic Fortran type, but um, you could still use a, you could still do something like have a, a void star that you can point to a Fortran handle. So there's, there's a couple ways to get around it. And that's, that's how the, the, uh, the Fortrillinos inversion of control works is by defining an extra layer of indirection that allows you to to convert Fortran pointers to the C++ pointers and then back at the other end. Um, so it would be tricky, but, um, and it wouldn't do memory management correctly, but but you could theoretically do something like that. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. I, I was just curious. And and maybe one more. So if, do you expect any issues with, uh, with smart pointers in C++? 
So we use a lot of smart pointers to handle the objects, um, you know, have a create function that returns a smart pointer to the object and then that's what we use. Um, yeah, so I, sh I should have added smart pointers to the list of features. So we can actually um, natively wrap the C++ 11 shared pointers as well as like boost or whatever. Um, so, so basically instead of, um, instead of the opaque pointer and, and this Fortran wrapper being to a raw pointer to the object type, it's an opaque pointer to the, to the shared pointer. So it handles it seamlessly basically. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so for the sake of time, thank you all for joining us today. A great webinar, Seth. Thank hope you. See you all. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks everyone for joining. All right, hope to see you folks in uh, next month. Thank you.